Hello, this is going to be a study of the um, teaching of Dr. Michael Heiser, and I've been meaning to do this for some time. I just uh, finished his book entitled Reversing Mount Hermon, and from experience, as well as reading scripture, I certainly understand the reality and the significance of the supernatural. And I appreciate Heiser's accenting of the supernatural um, in his biblical worldview. But I do have several substantive problems with his teaching. I don't enjoy criticizing others, but these are significant enough that I need to address them. I can only do, the, do them in basically bullet form format, you know, maybe a little bit more um, fuller in some areas, but each of these points could be a book because um, he's written on so much. Um, if you're an admirer of Heiser, like a lot of people are, I just ask that you please listen to what I have to say. As I said, I do not enjoy criticizing other people. Um, I've been looking at, uh, at his webpage, and I have perused his various blogs. As you know, he has a ton of different interests. And... Um, during July and August, he interacted with a Dr. Johnson regarding the atonement. And so at issue is the heart of the cross, which is itself the heart of the gospel. And let me say this, um, that the best modern treatment of the cross is John Stott's The Cross of Christ. I really highly recommend it, um, particularly in light of the discussion that we're about to have. Ah, boy. Okay, in a word, Michael Heiser either embraces or at least is very seriously entertaining a very uh, seriously deficient view of the atonement. <sighs> On the one hand, he says he affirms penal substitution in, in one of his blogs, but then he proceeds to evacuate it of all meaning or content that ha has anything to do with penal and or substitutionary atonement, all in the name of, quote, clarifying terminology. May I suggest that in his quest for clarification, he has basically eviscerated the gospel. The cross is the gospel. I would ask you to please visit his site for yourself and read the pertinent blogs on the atonement. They are, as I said, uh, written very recently during July and August of this year. And I believe they're under the title of the Naked Bible Blogs. There's a podcast and there's blogs. But based on comments in several blogs by him and Dr. Johnson, it is apparent that Heiser denies the following. He denies that Christ died as a penal substitute for our sins. He denies that Adam's sin was imputed to us. He rigorously denies the cardinal truth that Christ died as a propitiation for us, that is, becoming a curse for us, as per Galatians 3, and bore the wrath and anger of God that was due to our sin, which is spoken of in Romans 3.25, Hebrews 2.17, 1 John 2.2, 2, and 4.10. Now, two theologians by the name of Leon Morris and Roger Nicole have done a comprehensive analysis of biblical and extra-biblical literature on the 
a hilasmos and hilasterion Greek word group, and it does mean propitiation. Contra um, Heiser and Johnson and other people, there is just a growing antipathy amongst evangelicals against the notion of propitiation. Um, folks don't like the wrath of God. Paul spends two and a half chapters in the book of Romans dealing with the problem of God's wrath. And so, as you would expect, it needs to be dealt with. And that's what he does in the third chapter. And as John Stott says, quote, If God in Christ did not die in our place, there could be neither propitiation, nor redemption, nor justification, nor reconciliation. All history, human and cosmic, converges at the cross. And any divergence from the classic view of the cross spells doom for the church. This is not a truth that one can not deny without severe, severe reper repercussions. This is an essential. Okay, I'm very careful in my teaching to make the distinction distinction about essentials and non-essentials. And the, the cross is right up there with the deity of Christ, because that is the gospel. The manner in which this truth is explained away by Heiser and Johnson is deeply disturbing to me, and it displays an abysmal ignorance of the severity of the problem of human sin and how an utterly holy God could forgive hell-deserving sinners. Defective views of the cross usually stem from a deficient view of God's holy and righteous character and or a shallow understanding of human sinfulness. And how much of a problem, I mean really a problem, that posed for God to justify us in a just or righteous manner, which is... Um, talked about in Romans 3 21 through 26 which is a very dense pregnant uh, discussion of how God saved sinners in a way that was consistent with his righteousness it was not easy for God as a righteous God to save us how could God forgive us in a manner that was consistent with his holy righteousness Okay, all the other problems I have with Mr. Heiser pale in comparison to this watershed issue. In, in the outset, I was simply going to do a book review of Reversing Herman, but then I came across these blogs and it said all these other things like the Divine Council, they're significant, but they, like I said, they pale in comparison to this. If he can't be trusted with the gospel, I, I don't know. You know, a PhD does not make a man immune to serious error. And this is serious error. In God's providence, I'm about to discuss the atonement in my series on systematic theology. And unfortunately, I don't have the time and space to actually reply to this misguided teaching uh, any more than I already have right now. Number two. In light of Heiser's rejection of the gospel of God, it does not surprise me that he also seriously limits the God of the gospel. Specifically, again, this doesn't come from his books, but from his post. Um, there is a post in which he favorably uh, quotes a JBL article, Journal, Journal of Biblical Literature, from 2000, in which the author denies the full omniscience of God. Uh, and I'm going to give a little quote from it. Uh, it's entitled The Limits of Omniscience by um, a guy named Michael Karasik. This is a quote. The unspoken assumption that implicitly, uh, implicitly underlies this repeated focus on God's testing the heart is that when God wants to know what is in a particular human being's mind, God cannot sense it, but must deduce it. 
Moreover, the details of an individual's secret thoughts are not a question in these passages, but the nature or the moral character of the person. Except for one uh, occasion, Jeremiah 20:12, God is never described as seeing or hearing what is in the heart. Rather, the standard biblical imagery describing God's awareness of human thought depicts God as examining, examining it from the outside, not comprehending it directly. Like a technician with a lump of ore, God puts it on the fire to discover what it's made of, to remove its dross. The purpose of the writer is to decide whether the testing aspect of this process or the purification aspect is emphasized. Okay, either choice implies that God's access to human thoughts is indirect only. Okay, what you have there is, if you didn't catch it, let me summarize. The classic doctrine of God's omniscience, that is that he knows all things, including our thoughts and our hearts, is being denied. Okay. Jesus himself in the Gospels displays on numerous occasions um, um, omniscience uh, as far as the content of people's hearts and minds. Um, and again, that's what's being denied. So you first you have the Gospel, then you have a, a, a uh, an important uh, attribute of God uh, being questioned. And there is a growing movement amongst evangelicals to reappraise the teaching of Paul as well as that of God's attributes, uh, both, both of which are deeply disconcerting to me. Why? Why would Heiser be drawn to a theory which defiantly denies the classical biblical teaching and God's omniscience? I was ordained as a Presbyterian pastor in 1985. You know, if Dr. Heiser were examined in my denomination, he would be rejected as a candidate for preaching and for teaching in the seminary due to these two errors regarding the atonement and the omniscience of God. There's more. There's more to come, but these are these are the two worst, in my opinion. They're serious. Okay, number three. The third issue is more public, and it's what everybody's talking about. It's his, his, his use of First Enoch. I want to read from um, the Bible. Shortly before Paul died, he wrote these words, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be con complete, equipped for every good work. This text has rightly been said to support the notion of the comprehensive sufficiency of Scripture. That is, God has given us all the divine words we need, and we must not, we must not add or subtract from them, as Jesus said. Please keep this text in mind as we discuss this whole uh, role of 1st Enoch. Okay, 1st Enoch is accorded in my opinion, what I would call quasi-inspired status by Mr. Heiser, because he uses it as a template, template through which he reads the entire Bible to fill in the blanks, to connect the dots, to give us information where the Bible is insufficiently silent, where the Bible is intentionally silent. I should say. Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us what um, God's take is on this. It's one thing, okay, don't get me wrong, it, we, we do need to read the background information like one Enoch. It is, but it's one thing to see how first Enoch, how that background information can enrich our understanding of the meaning of the text. But it is uh, qualitatively different to add material to the Bible in order to fill in the gaps of knowledge regarding demonology, etc. 
the non-canonical, non-inspired story of the Watchers and their illegitimate offspring is the foundation of Heiser's theology, especially his interpretation of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. That clearly adds to Scripture, and it denies its sufficiency. You know, if we're not given more information in Genesis 6, then we're not meant to have that information, period. Okay, it's not like the general um, revelation that we can get regarding uh, other issues. When it comes to spiritual truth about the nature of demons and so forth, God is going to give us that information in his word and not through some non-inspired text. Um, that, that should be uh, self-evident. Now, don't understand why it's not. There's no escaping the sad fact that Heiser is in practice denying the sufficiency of Scripture by asserting the necessity of the information of one Enoch to make sense of the Bible's original mission and intent. Throughout his latest book, Reversing Herman, which I read, his thesis would be dead in the water without the Enochian material. This is adding to the Bible, as I said, what Jesus says is forbidden. You know, Heiser can say over and over um, that he does not believe in the canonicity of one Enoch, but actions speak louder than words. And after reading and hearing him many times, he affirms and dismisses arguments, both implicitly and explicitly, based on the fact that something does or does not fit in the Enochian model. What makes it all the more ironic is that Dr. Heiser has a site which is called the Naked Bible, where he wants us to strip ourselves and the Bible of all preconceived notions and read the Bible nakedly, so to speak, objectively. That's a noble objective. However, the irony comes when the, quote, Naked Bible is virtually cocooned with endless layers of Enochian cloth. Take off the Enochian garb, and you might have a naked Bible. In other words, his books contradict his stated mission. Heiser seems to suggest that there was a monolithic consensus regarding one Enoch in the Second Temple period. But Dr. Wayne Grudem studied all the relevant data of the time regarding Jewish interpretation of the sin of Genesis 6, 1-4, and discovered they were the, the um, Jewish... Um, rabbis and so forth were equally split on what occurred. Nine thought it was humans and nine thought it was angelic. The New Testament itself mentions various influences, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, scribes, the man on the street with his innumerable superstitions like incipient Gnosticism, not Docetism, Spiritism, and other occult practices and beliefs. But that really misses my point. First Enoch is not just useful background information for Heiser. It is a grid through which he sifts all the biblical data, and that's not right. That the biblical writers quote from it does not mean that the rest of it is useful any more than the many other extra-biblical quotes we find in Acts and other books of the Bible. There was an intentional 400-plus year prophetic silence between Malachi and John the Baptist, during which time First Enoch was written. It is not inspired. It seems that Enoch uh, accurately contained a memory of a quote from Enoch, and that's the extent of its lawful usefulness. Anything beyond the New Testament use of it is unwarranted. Yes, the biblical writers read books, as Heiser reminds us. <laughs> of course they did. And um, we do not need, nor should we seek, outside sources to fill in the gaps to connect the dots um, due to the, quote, insufficient revelation from God. If God's word is perfect, comprehensively sufficient, inerrant, and complete, then it only stands the reason that we better not add to God's word. I'm ignorant of many things, y'all, but I do know what the Bible says about demons, and I have done battle with them in dozens of demonic cases. 
And First Enoch adds nothing to this discussion but confusion regarding their identity. Just as Jesus and Satan have multiple names and titles, so do fallen angels. I've written on the interchangeability of evil spirits, unclean spirits, demons, principalities, powers, elemental spirits, and Satan's angels. Um, so why were lowly demons, which were allegedly the souls of deceased hybrids, according to uh, Heiser, be given the huge responsibility in Revelation 16 of helping with the work of the false prophet? When one would think that that would be the work of a higher up in this scenario, one of the chief Elohim. You know, the scribes accused Jesus in Mark uh, 3.22 of casting out demons by Satan or reusable. He was a prince of demons, Archonte. Satan is called the prince or ruler of demons. And Jesus picks up on this and he shows how it would be Satan fighting against his own army. What I'm trying to say is that there seems to be an identity of kind suggested, but difference in authority as in military. My point being is that they are all fallen angels with Satan as the general. Using Occam's razor, one can explain all the data with less variables. Okay, number four, getting to the divine council. <laughs> This is important to Heiser's worldview and cosmology. Um, is the demotion, notion of divine counsel, the Elohim, the good angels who went bad and are allegedly wrecking havoc on the world. I ask you a question, okay? Whatever your views are on this notion, how often does Jesus or the apostles explicitly mention the renegade, renegade Elohims as the ones responsible? for current problems of their day? None, never in the Bible. Never in the discussions of uh, exorcism do you ever hear it. Um, the Bible doesn't speak in this fashion. In all the gospel accounts of exorcisms, the spirits are usually called unclean spirits or demons, but never Elohim. In his warnings to the disciples, Jesus and the apostles never mention, watch out for the Elohim by name, never mentions them, though he does mention Satan. And likewise, with Paul's vast vocabulary, he warns believers of fallen angels, demons, you know, principalities and powers and so forth, which are all synonyms for fallen angels. But why doesn't if this notion is so important, I heard an interview today in which they were talking about alien abductions, and they rightly pointed out that it was a demonic thing, but they were referring to the demons as um, the Elohim, you know, the fallen angels. And I said, why are they using that language? Uh, because the New Testament does not refer to um the the end the day in and day out activity of the demonic as as Elohim. Um, we'll get to Psalm eighty two in a moment. All right, but there does appear at least at times to be a council of angelic hosts who do gather in God's throne room, and there's likely angelic beings overseeing specific countries in Daniel uh, ten and eleven, which are under God's absolute sovereign control. See this in Acts seventeen and. Isaiah 40 through 48. But my contention is that uh, Mr. Heiser goes well beyond the biblical data in suggesting the full orb notion of a divine counsel, which is constantly assisting, counseling, and helping to run God's universe and keep it in good and righteous working order. But I guess since he's willing to question the omniscience of God, um, what else is he wobbly on? I'm not being sarcastic. I've got some serious concerns. Um, why doesn't an omnipotent, why does an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God need a divine counsel to help advise or run his cosmos? I understand that our triune God is supremely personal uh, as well as infinite and thus seems to, to delight in working in, through, and with his creatures. We 
in Colossians 3, it says, We reign with him now through our union with Christ. In Job and elsewhere, God does gather heavenly beings, including Satan, for a power. But unlike Kaiser, I, I don't see this as habitual and certainly do not think that this council should be called divine, nor that, that they have the kind of authority he calls for. As I said, I, I do see some role for angelic meetings um, if they're going to be his messengers, which is what they basically are, then as creatures they have to go to command central to get their marching orders from the reigning king of kings. The text which apparently got Heiser started down this divine council uh, course is at Psalm 82. And I think he's mistranslated that as Jesus himself shows. And I'll get to it. Um, before looking at that, let me take a look at a, a quote from one of his writings. Um, I'm not going to quote the whole thing. It says, In all of the manifestations of divine counsel imagery, we encounter Israel's way of dealing in a theological and foundational way with the problem of the one and the many. Do you have that? The problem of the one and the many and how they are held together with the single reality that is the cosmos. And then he goes on to talk about how this... Um, plurality and diversity uh, is can be traced to the divine council and I'm trying to save time here but my reply is that he does have this in this interesting discussion of the one and the many and the plurality and unity that notion of the one and the many preoccupied the minds of the best pagan philosophers in antiquity so Heiser posits the divine counsel or, and or the Lord of hosts as a means of expressing the cosmological basis for unity and diversity, but that would be giving, seen to be giving to his creation a partial role in something only God himself can do. Jesus is the Logos and is he who created and holds the universe together. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. And indeed, Jesus is one who makes it the, um, it the universe. Unity amidst staggering diversity. In addition, the triune God himself, whom Heiser never mentions in this particular article, is the supreme and only adequate basis for explaining the one and the many, unity and diversity, because both, one and the many, exist in the very being of God, one God and three persons. So, let me move on here. Um, fifthly, um, I, I really think that it's unnecessary uh, for, he's added confusion by referring to this uh, council as divine. Um, he should know that the common understanding, even dictionary definition of divine is a reference to full deity. There's some secondary um, definitions. In back in the 1700s, you know, the 1600s, the, the theologians were called divines, but we live in 2018 where d a divine usually has to do with full deity. So, just wish that he would have to clarify. Um, he makes it clear that he believes in only one cre you know, creator God, but you have these guys with little g um, and I think that's where it's causing problems okay in one place he, he, he seems to refer to neutral spirits I'm not sure where this came from but if that's the case that's confusing at best because as creator the Lord has pre-interpreted every fact in the cosmos so there's nothing neutral in his universe there's no morally neutral category either ontologically or morally Neutrality is a myth in God's universe. If something or an action were neutral, I mean, how would God judge it as good or bad if it was something that was, you know, neutral? I want to um, take the time to read Psalm 82 because um, this is what got him going. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? 
Give justice to the weak and to the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the wicked and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in the darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, You are God, sons of the Most High. All of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall uh, die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nation. Psalm 82. Now I'm going to read to you from John 10, before I quote. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him, Jesus. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And the Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. And listen to this. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped their hands. See, this is crucial. This is where guys are going, as I understand it. Um, Heiser's interpretation of Psalm 82 is foundational to his whole system of thought. The psalmist's complaint here is reminiscent of many psalms and prophets thundering against rulers and justice to wind, wind, widows and orphans. The ideal Davidic king is to protect the powerless from oppressors. Verse 1, the Heiser takes this as a reference to angelic beings. There are good reasons to reject that interpretation, chief of which is Jesus' own interpretation of it as humans, which I'll come back to. But it makes much better sense in Psalm 82.1 to see them as human rulers who gain their authority from the living God. You can see parallels in Psalm 58, 1, Romans 13, 1 through 7, 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. Jesus seems to have the psalm in, uh, in this way, especially um, verses 34 through 35. He seems to have this interpretation humans in verse 34 through 35 he cites psalm 82 6 describing the gods as those to whom the word of god had come which means they were human okay there's only one true most high as these unjust gods like other men must die and face judgment there's nothing in Jesus' discussion there to even hint that, that the, of this whole divine council Elohim um, notion. It's um, human rulers who at times were called Elohim, gods. So in John 10, 30 through 4 through 35, Jesus cites this text in a debate to deflect criticism for calling himself the Son of God. Deuteronomy 14.1 calls Israel's God, Israel God's sons. And verse 8 is perhaps connected to Psalm 2, in which all nations are under God's sovereign control. And the Messianic king will have all, all the nations as his inheritance. At the ascension, uh, this became especially true when Jesus was crowned king of kings. You know, um, again, Jesus' point in quoting this verse is that if human judges can in some sense be called gods in light of their role as representatives of God, this designation is even more appropriate for the one who truly is the Son of God. He defends the authority of Scripture based on the quoting of just one word, God's. Okay, I've already gone on for too long. 
but this should be sufficient for those who have ears to hear, um, for those who are teachable, to be discerning, to listen to my plea for you to think through. I'm not saying everything in Heiser says is wrong. I'm just pointing out some significant issues. Thank you.